Hello, and welcome to another edition of Brussels Sprouts. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Jim Townsend. And we're so glad you can join us. Since the outbreak of war between Israel and Hamas this past fall, many have feared the possibility that the fighting could metastasize into a broader regional conflict. Such fears have only grown in recent weeks as violence has risen across the Middle East. One of the most notable developments has been an escalation in attacks from the Houthi rebels on ships in the Red Sea, leading the United States to respond with missile strikes over the past week. Yet this is far from the only sign of growing conflict, with Western officials having also expressed concerns about armed exchanges between Hezbollah and Israel, Iranian missile strikes on Iraqi territory, and much more. As violence in the Middle East expands, the United States and Europe will face increasing pressure to take actions aimed at restabilizing the region, complicating their ability to devote resources to other ongoing challenges, especially the war in Ukraine. And so to unpack these latest events and their implications for the transatlantic relationship, we're really pleased to have John Alterman on the podcast with us today. Welcome, John. Thank you, Andrea. Um, For our listeners, John Alterman is Senior Vice President and holds the Zygmunt Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and is Director of the Middle East Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Okay, John, as I was just telling you, we on Brussels Sprouts haven't covered what's going on in the Middle East uh, with the exception of one episode kind of just in the aftermath of the October 7th attack. So, There's a lot going on, but how would you set the stage and describe what's happened since October 7th? There's a lot that's happened. Principally, there's a war that nobody anticipated and which the United States has been trying and thus far been unable uh, to shape the trajectory of. Uh, it seems to me that there's a, not only has the war disrupted what had been a general pattern of normalization between Israel and its Arab partners and a general decline in uh, regional tensions, possibility of rapprochement with Iran, now we see the Iranian-sponsored axis of resistance not only showing its its face in a number of fronts in the region, but also winning over the global south and peeling much of the global south away from Western powers. Uh, American diplomacy has been active and visible, but not very consequential. It seemed to me that European diplomacy has been somewhat less visible, similarly inconsequential, if not even more so. And for all the people we're talking about how important China is in the region and China's growing stakes in the region, China's growing weight in the region. I've been shocked that China has been really out of the game, despite the fact that the Houthi actions in the Red Sea, allegedly in support of the Palestinians, uh, hurt Chinese trade with Europe and hurt Egypt which is a country that relies on the Suez Canal for a large part of its foreign exchange as a foreign exchange crisis, and is a country increasingly important to China. And yet China is completely inconsequential on the issue of the the Houthis threatening trade, uh, including Chinese trade in the Red Sea. So none of it's good. I think a lot of this is going to go on for a bit uh, for reasons we can discuss. And it's really a challenge not only for countries in the region, it's a real challenge for this sense of indispensability of the United States. And I think a challenge to the belief that if the United States and its European partners get together, there's almost nothing we can't do. And I haven't I haven't seen a lot of consequential action in that regard at all. Could could we do some could you help us do some myth busting? Sure. Uh, it, it might be that these aren't myths. This is a, this is ground truth. But I'm just I just was wondering two things. One is, um, one of the things that we heard early on was that this happened. Gaza exploded, and the and Hamas was went after Israel because they were trying to scuttle this the talks between Saudi Arabia and Israel. The 
U.S., you know, that's this rapprochement, and it was starting to get traction. And Hamas just uh, said that, and this is the time we're going to do this. And they did it to undercut those talks. I, I, I felt that uh, this had been long planned, and uh, it was just coincident that that it happened during these this rash, rapprochement talks, or or in fact, was that really what sparked it off and surprised everyone? Uh, was that Hamas did that? So that's that's number one. The second myth is people immediately said, "Well, this is Iran. This is Iran. Iran's behind this. Iran trained Hamas. Iran, uh, Iran planned this whole thing. Iran wanted to scuttle those talks. So Iran." twisted the arms of Hamas, who were actually had their own little rob approach going on with Israel. But Iran jumped in the middle of it and said, OK, Hamas, uh, let's 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 attack. Uh, and uh, and so so those that, you know, the myths, if you will, about uh, the Iranians being involved and that this was to uh, scuttle those talks. Is that true uh, or elements are true or uh, have this been long in the planning? Hamas had reached the end of the road. They were ready to go. And it was just coincidental. So what's this? What's the scoop? So I would say, first of all, this took two years to plan. Ah. The Israeli-Saudi talks really started last spring, about nine months ago. Right. Um, this wasn't about the Iran-Saudi talk. This was about the Abraham Accords, which the Iran- which the, which the Israel-Saudi talks grew out of. Right. But that's not, Hamas's objection was not to Saudi and Israel talking. It was to the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, and Israel's conviction that it could uh, find its place in the region without addressing the Palestinian issues at all. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. So I, my strong view, and I wrote about this in September was, I didn't think we we're nearly as close as people in the white house thought to getting an agreement between the Saudis and the Iranians, because I think I'm sorry, the Saudis and the Israelis, because I couldn't imagine why the Saudis would feel a sense of urgency to make a deal with this Israeli prime minister and this American president. Yeah. I think they thought they would get a better deal with a future president, perhaps Trump, with a future Israeli prime minister. So let's keep this going along. Let's, you know, as as my uh, democratic socialist children will sometimes talk about, let's shift the Overton window, right? Let's change <laughs> people's sense of what is possible but let's not conclude the deal. So I don't think we're on, I mean, as I said, and, and people involved in talks in the White House tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. But I believe having been working with Saudis for 30 years, I know a little bit what I'm talking about. MBS believes he'll be in power for the next 40 years. And if this is one of the most consequential diplomatic steps you're ever gonna take, why are you making it at this moment? And I thought the Saudis are going to drag this out a little bit. So I don't think this was about scuttling Saudi-Israeli rapprochement. It was about, it was about scuttling Arab-Israeli rapprochement. In terms of what the Iranians have been trying to do, you know, I was just talking to a banker. I said the Iranians had a great Q4 because everybody's talking about Iran in the region. Their interest in Hamas is strategic and not they're not making tactical directions. They're, it's a strategic investment. They probably put in about $100 million a year, which, you know, two or three times the budget of a think tank in Washington and arguably more strategically consequential. Uh, it's a relatively modest investment. They talk in general terms about what they're trying to do. Iran loves the fact that they put a somewhat constrained set of resources into an axis of resistance in the Middle East. And everybody talks about Iranian power and influence in the Middle East. And just think for the last quarter, everybody's been fighting, everybody's been on the terms that Iran wants and nobody's attacking Iran. They're doing really well. That's what a great 
return on investment. That's a great, great point. Well, could I ask just a quick follow-up? Andrea is being very gentle with me today. I, I'm, I'm not sure why. It must be the snow that is distracted. I those World War II books in the background <laughs> of Zoom call. Yeah. She's intimidated. <laughs> Well, um, so, you know, you, you mentioned that it's been going on for two years, uh, the planning for this, uh, which I think you're right. I think it's this isn't something that they did on the back of a napkin one night. So um, so given that, uh, who drafted and exercised and, and, and uh, gathered the uh, stores of ammunition and, and all the cleverness that the Hamas used in that those opening hours? Who put that all together? Was that all homegrown and exercised over the past two years? And uh, and, it, and 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 so th th Iran wasn't in there, you know, doing it all. It was really Hamas themselves that did it. That's number one. And then number two, um, you know, another myth, if you will, was oh my God, the Israelis—they were napping, they weren't watching it, they they were distracted by Netanyahu, they were they didn't have enough people. This is da 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 da. So how did it happen that this was being planned for two years and the Israelis didn't even get a whiff? Or did they actually see it, the intel people? And it was really the political side in Tel Aviv that said, nah, you're smoking dope. This isn't going to happen. And, and, and it was like 9-11 in the sense that, you know, the evidence was there. It just was not it was not uh, it didn't reach the right people at the right time who had to who drew the right conclusions. But but the, but in fact, the Israeli intel people knew it was there. The military did as well, but they were not getting the response from the political side that they should have. So, so two questions but, there. But, but, but the, they're, they're related questions. I mean, they're, they're two sides of the same coin um, on the on the question of who planned this. Yeah, I think Hamas operational security was obviously profoundly important. I can't imagine that they thought they could go blabbing about this in Beirut to whatever sort of star chamber group of bad guys were around, because I yeah. don't think they think the Israelis haven't penetrated that. They can't talk about it because they think the Israelis have penetrated that. I think yeah. Hamas spends its life convinced the Israelis have penetrated most of what they do. Hamas partly did whatever communication, they didn't do it over cell phones, they didn't do it over encrypted apps, they did it over radios, which the Israelis stopped listening to because they were convinced the radios weren't significant. So operational security was preeminent. I have not seen any of the intelligence, but my strong belief is that not only did Hamas not communicate about this with anybody outside of Gaza, they didn't communicate it to the political guys in Hamas who were playing catch up and who were surprised as anybody else. The Iranians were surprised as anybody else because the guys in Gaza were utterly convinced that keeping it secret in Gaza is hard enough. If you start blabbing about it with other people, the Israelis will penetrate it. And so I think there was part of the lessons learned from Hamas for decades has been operational security is supreme and they were extraordinarily disciplined on operational security. What did the Israelis see? The Israelis reportedly saw some of this. There were some lower level Israelis, including a number of women doing military service in the South who were concerned about some of this, but there's a certain arrogance that I think tends to suffuse some military organizations and especially has suffused Israeli security assessments that they're convinced their intelligence is good enough that they understand their adversary. They couldn't conceptualize that Hamas would be so bold as to do this. They couldn't conceptualize that Hamas would be able to break through their three-level fence let alone do so in 29 places. They, they sort of, they lulled themselves into the, into the attic, into believing in the adequacy of what they had done. There was a focus led by the political echelon to concentrate on security issues in the West Bank and to assume the Gaza problem was largely solved. 
But I don't think that was merely a political issue and that the political people were getting these clear warnings and said, no, we're, we're, we're paying attention to something else. I think the military guys also said, you know, we have operational per personnel issues. Nobody wants to serve there. We'll just automate it. We don't actually have to have people on the ground. We the Palestinians, they're a bunch of idiots. They're, they're submissive. You know, we know how to control them because we'll dangle jobs, we'll dangle money, we'll do this, we'll do that. We, we, we've learned how to treat them. And Hamas lulled them into a sense of security because, for instance, there were very clear tensions between Hamas and Islamic Jihad over when to attack Israel. And when Islamic Jihad went to attack Israel, Hamas said, no, 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 we're not doing that now. The Israelis took that as we understand Hamas. We we can push the buttons for Hamas. It's just Islamic Jihad that's a problem. But but we we it, it reinforced the Israeli belief that they understood Hamas and they could shape incentives for Hamas and punishments that Hamas was under control. And what they understood on October 7th is Hamas wasn't under control. And a little bit like 9-11. The problem is a failure of imagination on the Israeli side. That and that, and I air land said, and sea, air land and sea, the air land and sea by a bunch of Palestinians who are, are fenced into an area twice the size of the District of Columbia. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and but did you know? I think it might. And I'm 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 thin ice here with Andrea, but I have to say I think with uh, the NSC and particularly Jake Sullivan, that was a failure of imagination too. I mean, he wrote the article on, on foreign affairs and gave a speech at a think tank earlier as well, talking about how great- that speech. What's that? I was at that speech. Oh, were you? Yeah. And uh, I, and so uh, they must have, uh, I would imagine they were as shocked as everybody else. How could they have been so shocked and so proud of what obviously was a bit of a, a house of cards? So. You know, partly the the U.S. intelligence community reportedly had contracted out a lot of the uh, Hamas reporting to the Israelis, um, partly, right, for, for reasons of, of just resources. Um, you know, I think there was a, a sense on the U.S. side, on the Biden administration side, that there's no willingness on the Israeli side to move on Arab-Israeli peace issues. So why are you putting resources into understanding either the Palestinian or Israeli side if you don't have a prospect for moving it? Right. Um, you know, whether whether the U.S. should, in, should have invested more in the threat piece coming yeah. out of Gaza? Yeah. Does that affect the United States? I mean, it does now because of the way the, the strike played out and, and the way the U.S. Is, is engaged in military operations throughout the Middle East. But in terms of Hamas isn't threatening Americans, I think bureaucratically it would have been hard in the United States to say, we have to invest in our own reporting in Gaza in a world of constrained resources. And we can't just rely on the Israelis in a world of constrained resources. Because why? Because... I mean, it, it, I think it starts to become a difficult bureaucratic argument to make. And it, it, as, it, as you know, you've been in the U.S. government long enough. Bureaucratic arguments and budgets are half of what the U.S. government does. Yeah. And, you know, you're absolutely right. And I just I just sit here and this, this is one of these great teaching moments when I teach my class. I'm going to have to raise this where for all the right reasons that you say you know, we're going to outsource to Israel. We've got to, we've got to focus on other things that are more important, et cetera, et cetera. You do that and then shit happens, as they say. And we end up with one of the greatest foreign policy crises for the, for the Biden administration from a part of the world that they outsourced and thought wasn't really important. And then- But let me, oh, yeah. but let um, me, because it's not just the Middle East though, right? So coming into with the Biden administration, and I think we've talked about this before, you know, the remit of the Russia people was to keep Russia quiet. The remit of the Middle East people was to keep the Middle East quiet. And here we are. So I guess my, you know, John, John, to what extent do you think that this 
narrative of the United States only wanting to do China, pacing challenge, it's so important, it's all about China. To what extent do you think that created an environment that maybe was conducive to this, that it that we signaled to adversaries that we simply care less about these other regions? And we blinded ourselves. We said, oh, well, you know, we're, we're going to focus on China and put our resources on China. And and we we willfully neglected other parts of the world that came back and said, not so fast. So, 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 let, me, let me give let me give let me give you another let me give you another take, which is we spent 20 years fighting wars in the Middle East. And, you know, as, as the uh, Indian Minister of External Affairs says, uh, the United States spent 20 years fighting and not winning in the Middle East, and China spent 20 years winning and not fighting in the Middle East. <laughs> and Right? And Jake yeah. Sullivan comes in and says, we're going to start doing all the elements of statecraft. And we're going to start talking more about trade and, and development and economics. And we're going to have a, a, a more holistic approach right. to the region. Every problem in the region doesn't have military solutions. Right. And I think, well, the consensus in the Middle East had been that the United States was disengaging because its military presence was diminished. I think what was actually happening was there was an effort to rebalance military and diplomatic and economic instruments. Um, I think that's what Jake Sullivan was talking about when you start talking about how these things were generally going in a more positive direction, you know, and it's hard to do stuff. I think that the administration was serious about trying to, to get back to some sort of understanding and modus vivendi for Iran. Uh, which would involve something other than military threats and just ratcheting up sanctions that go one way. I think they felt that they had reached a much more constructive relationship with the Saudis. Um, you know, we have a very robust relationship with Jordan. Lebanon's in a hard place, but we were, you know, trying to get the Lebanese to do the right thing. So I think they thought they were doing statecraft broadly. and. You know, the thing that, that would get uh, get the White House excited was talking about, you know, build back better world as it applied to the Middle East. And, you know, th th there's something in the in the Jake Sullivan speech, too, about this, uh, you know, corridor that was India and the Gulf yeah. and went to Israel. And, you know, yes. I mean, I think a whole lot. So I don't think they were being irresponsible and neglecting the Middle East. I think they were trying to take a less military approach to the Middle East. And the reality is the Middle East is a militarized place where military stuff matters. The problem I think they have now is an old problem of how do you blend military and diplomatic instruments of power, because ultimately most of what you need doesn't have a clear point of military victory. It's getting people to make political decisions where they're taking the military calculus into account. And how we deal, for example, with shaping Israeli behavior, how we shape our behavior, this is where the real challenge for the Biden administration is, and it's made much more difficult by the fact that nobody knows if the president's going to be around in a year. And there's a strong instinct on the Israeli side, I think, among the the current government to to try to drag the war out to preserve Netanyahu's uh, political future and to avoid the, the reckoning that will come over some of the intelligence questions and strategic misjudgments we talked about earlier. Uh, there's a sense that if there's going to be some hard compromises made, wouldn't you rather deal with the Trump administration rather than the Biden administration? So I think the Israelis are inclined to hold back. I think President Biden looks at Benjamin Netanyahu and says, well, he might be the prime minister I have to deal with, but I could also deal with somebody like Benny Dagan. I could be dealing with somebody like Yair Lapid. Is there a way to, to 
to maybe galvanize some other kind of politics in Israel. And if he has a, a chance at influencing Israeli politics, when do you when do you play that card? Uh, and how do you play it? And I think that's one of the big considerations there. And then you have Mahmoud Abbas as the Palestinian president, staying in office 14 years after his term expired. He's 88. He has 10% approval ratings, which make every politician except Benjamin Netanyahu jealous. Uh, how do you, how do, if, if everybody understands that part of this has to be having a political horizon for Palestinians, but you have a complete absence of Palestinian leadership and no obvious successor and no obvious lines under which a succession battle would unfold. And I think what that leads you to is you ultimately are going to need Arab governments to be the guarantor for, for Palestinians. So yeah. how do you line up the Arab governments, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris, the, the Jordanians, the Egyptians, to move things in the direction you want? What are they going to ask for? How do you give them the confidence? That's, I think, and, and, and ultimately, again, there are all sorts of, of military, short-term military tasks and short-term military decisions. Can you use supply issues to influence the way the Israelis uh, engage? We certainly have given them advice. We've sent people over to talk to the Israelis about thinking about strategic intent and all those things. But how do you use all those tools to ultimately get people to make political decisions that get us past this? Because getting us past this, I don't think you can ever completely eradicate Hamas from Gaza. Yeah. But you can make Hamas marginal in how Gaza operates. You can get Israelis to believe that it's good enough. You can get Arabs to believe that there's enough of a future. You can get Palestinians to believe there's some alternative, some progress. That's all politics. And you have to use the military instruments to set up the politics. And the politics are tough and they involve democratic states and undemocratic states. And I guarantee you the undemocratic states are not going to be interested in creating a democracy in Palestine. And there are some development folks who say we absolutely shouldn't be interested in getting a democracy in Palestine either because that's not going to be. Any, so this is all super complicated. It takes a long time. And our elections make it really hard for a president who is, I don't know, would you say 50-50 or not, but it's really hard when the president is not in a dominating position and has an expiration date to, or a potential expiration date to, to move everybody's politics in the right direction. Yeah. It's such a, it, I mean, it, sometimes talking to you, John, makes me feel at least slightly better about the problems that we deal with in Eurasia, I mean, with Russia, Ukraine. I mean, this, I mean, just, it's really daunting. And your point about the president and, you know, not knowing whether Biden's going to be around and getting a better deal under Trump, it's obviously a similar, similar dynamic from Putin's perspective. He would have no incentive to end the war there. So basically, in the transatlantic community, we're looking at a 2024 where there's basically every incentive of these leaders to drag wars out. And then I would imagine that the longer that this war goes on, that risk of expansion um, the risk that this turns into something even worse, particularly in the Middle East, is going to stay with us. And already, given everything that's happening with the Iranian strikes into um, Iraq and Pakistan, I mean, I guess that's my question is like, and I'm sure this is the question that you get a lot is what are the risks that this gets really a lot worse? And if you could talk a little bit, I'm especially interested in what Iran is doing at the moment and in and how it's viewing this current moment. As you said, it's it's been a good quarter for Iran, but what 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 I mean, what's except for that suicide bombing, right, a couple of weeks ago, exactly. which was not good, right. uh, and which I think helps explain what they're doing with Pakistan. But you know, from an Iranian perspective. They're playing a long game, and the fact that that everybody is talking about them is good. The fact that everybody's talking about their their proxies and clients is really good. Uh, I think their goal is to get the United States out of the Middle East, and the Iraqis are talking about this much more now than they were talking about it two weeks ago. So I think you know, from their perspective, this is all going in a good direction. 
there's a broader issue. You know, I think that the Chinese have come to see this principally as let's get the global South really alienated from the United States and U.S. leadership. Let's show the U.S. to be feckless and ineffectual. Um, and the Russians. Yeah, similar. Yeah, no, and, and I think that, that this is, you know, sort of all going in that direction. I think from an Iranian perspective, because so many of the trends are so positive from an Iranian viewpoint, um, you don't want to escalate. I mean, the ball is coming to them. So why would you why would you move? The ball's coming to them. It's exactly what they were hoping for in the world. Um, this whole sort of rules-based international order seems to be collapsing. Everybody's talking about the hypocrisy of the United States, the images that are that everybody's seeing throughout the developing world, not so much in the United States, although some in the United States, but certainly the the there is no diversity in the images that much of the world is seeing from this conflict. And it's making people say, how can the United States stand by and encourage this and supply weapons for it? And so I think from an Iranian perspective, from a Chinese perspective, from a Russian perspective, um, this is all going pretty well. And uh, you know, I think that the Biden team is hard pressed to, to navigate between U.S. politics, Israeli politics, global public opinion, um, it's its a mess. Well, let me, uh, oh, Andrea, if I can just follow up real quick. You know, as we look at the theater of operations now from a U.S. military perspective, we're looking at naval ships, you know, in the Red Sea, we're looking at... Uh, uh, our forces in Syria and in uh, Iraq are being uh, shelled or uh, missiles fired, rockets fired at them. Uh, so we're under fire. We're returning fire in various ways in both both parts of that theater. Where do you think it, it could pop up that we have an, another area uh, where where U.S. forces are going to be under fire? I mean, right now it's Syria. It's it's. Uh, it's uh, northern Iraq. It's the Houthis firing at the at the naval ships. Uh, do you think that if if you were a planner in the Pentagon, would it be the Persian Gulf that we feel we might start seeing some action? Would it? Where will where will this uh, this uh, um, uh, whack a mole pop up uh, again? Uh, is it the Gulf, or do you think there's another area that we have better be watching? As I said, there's a certain a certain gloriousness for the Iranians that nobody's firing at the Iranians. And they're not exactly pulling triggers, but from a strategic perspective, this is the axis of resistance the Iranians have been investing in for decades. Right. Uh, and there, you know, there, there's a while when the mantra in the Arab world is the Iranians control four Arab capitals. And I don't think that's ever been true. They certainly have influence in four Arab capitals, if not more. But from an Iranian perspective, investing in all of these paramilitary groups um, has been really good. I could imagine that we could have increased violence in Lebanon, a place where Hezbollah um, controls large parts of the country, uh, where the writ of the central government is constrained where the U.S. is talking about opening a brand new embassy. Right. Uh, there aren't that many Americans in Lebanon. We certainly have left Lebanon in haste previously. Um, but I, if I were in Lebanon, I would be pretty concerned. We don't have a lot of people in Iraq. Um, and so it, it's not a great target. Um, I think the government of Jordan is is 100% with us, and so there might be some uh, some small scale stuff, but I don't think you're going to have a large scale problem in Jordan. We don't have that many people in Egypt. I think the Egyptian government is is closely aligned with us. Um, could somebody attack U.S. targets in the Gulf? You know, we have a fair amount of infrastructure in places like 
the the UAE, but the UAE also has a fairly comprehensive domestic intelligence network. So I think that becomes a a hard target. Maybe Kuwait, I would be worried about, where I think the domestic intelligence is is less robust, and you still have a a large American presence, uh, partly for historical reasons. Um, I don't think the Iranians are interested in getting drawn into something symmetrical. I think the Iranians, you know, somebody from the intelligence community retired, uh, put it, I think, perfectly. The Iranians want things that are attributable but deniable. Yeah. And I think that's where they'd go. And so I think I, the thing I'd worry more, most about is Lebanon. I think I would be concerned in the Emirates. I think I'd be pretty concerned in Kuwait. Um, I don't know enough about how we operate in Bahrain to know if that's something I should worry about or not. But we clearly have, you know, a big naval base. Yeah. In Bahrain. I don't, and and you know, and the Iranians have have penetrated into Bahrain and, and have some influence there, and occasionally in their giddier moments, referred to as the Thirteenth Province. Quick question. I know we're nearing the end and and then I'll maybe ask you to get out your crystal ball right at the end. But to what extent do you think Iran has been in any way emboldened by its deepening relationship with Russia? Do you think that play is zero role? Does it is it consequential in any way from Tehran's perspective? I mean, because the one thing I'm watching closely is kind of this coalescing. I'll call it the axis of upheaval, but the Russia, Iran, North Korea, China. And I, I kind of I wonder how consequential it is from Iran's perspective that it's got this deepening relationship and it's watching kind of this deepening cooperation amongst a lot of these like minded countries. So I my take is that at base, the Iranians have a lot of self-pity for for how isolated they are in the world and how nobody um, nobody understands their greatness or as, as a friend of mine sometimes says, they don't see my inner beauty. Uh, I think the Iranians think a lot about that, and I think the, the 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 fact that they have a relationship, a growing relationship with Russia, makes them feel better that somebody does see their inner beauty. The Chinese, for all the the robustness of the Chinese Iranian relationship, uh, China represents about a third of all of Iranian trade, and Iran represents less than one percent of Chinese trade. And the Chinese never let the Iranians forget it. Yeah. I mean, the, the Iranians are tactically useful for the Chinese, but not really important. And I think the idea that they're strategically important to somebody yeah. puts a huge amount of wind in their sails. But still, there's a lot of self-pity about how the world doesn't see their inner beauty. And I think this sort of gets them a little bit further up that ladder, but they still spend a lot of time yeah. lamenting the fact that the world uh, remains arrayed against them. All right, very last question, and you can do it quickly because I know we're pressing up against your window here. But um, you know, what should we expect for the rest of this year? I mean, it, your, to your point, is this something that the Israelis certainly are likely to drag on at least through November? And some of these other actors, I mean, are people, Houthis, uh, Hezbollah, others, likely to continue to try to take advantage of this window to advance their interests? I mean, should we expect this degree of tumult that we've seen over the last several weeks, where it's like a really, I feel like unprecedented kind of exchange of violence across borders? Is this what 2024 is going to look like? Or do you expect? I, I think what 2024 is going to look like is you're going to have people who are going to try to accelerate this toward resolution. People are going to try to delay it from resolution. And the possibility, the constant possibility, you're going to have an event that changes the way everybody sees this. We had that with the Athene Hospital bombing three days into the into the war, where suddenly the world opinion shifted. Even though it turned out the Israelis didn't bomb the hospital, it doesn't matter yeah. what the reality is. What matters is the narrative, the images that come out of it. And so you'll have some folks who are trying to move this forward, some folks who are trying to pull it back and keep it going, and the constant possibility that what actually shifts this is not the people who are trying to move it forward, not the people who are trying to hold it back, but something that happens that completely changes the equation and makes what was previously unthinkable inevitable and makes what seemed inevitable unthinkable. What that's going to be, how it happens, when it happens, that's a whole, I mean, we're, we're in a black swan world. 
but I think we could have a, a I think there are certainly people who want to drag this out for a year. There are people who who want this to all wrap up in a couple of weeks. And, you know, between those, there's a lot of space, but there's also the daily possibility that something happens that just puts us into a whole different place, which could be everything from getting the Israelis to totally rethink what they're doing to uh, pushing us into a, a much wider war. And I think that's what's most likely. It's, it's going to be one of these things you're going to wake up in the morning, look at your iPhone and go, oh, my God. And that'll be what it is. Whatever it is, I think that's going to be the most likely turn. If there's going to be one, it'll be that. Well, we love to end on an uplifting on uplifting notes. It's kind of our forte, right? Jim? I did my job. Jim's the one who's Mr. Doom and Gloom. I know. I, know. I, know. I, I get paid for that, you know. That I don't do it for free. You get paid. <laughs> I do this. I do this job for free. Yeah, got off my game. <laughs> oh, this was great, John. Thank you for doing it. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, at least in our community, I think maybe people aren't following it quite as closely, but that's why I learned a lot. You got us up to speed and really, um, I think, shaped expectations for for this year. So appreciate. Yeah, thanks so much. Great to see you both. Great to see you. Thank you Bye-bye. so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Brussels Sprouts, brought to you by the Transatlantic Security Team at the Center for a New American Security. You can find all of our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to rate and review Brussels Sprouts so that new listeners are able to find the show.